Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church, and today we're going to look at the ultimate sacrifice in the Old Testament. When Abraham was prepared to offer up his only beloved son Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. This is the high point, really, in the Old Testament, the high point of faith, the most significant event in the drama of redemption leading up to the death and resurrection of Christ himself. And it provides a great picture of how God the Father would provide eternal salvation for us by offering up his only beloved son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice for us. And also, as we look at this story through Abraham and Isaac, we'll be able to discover exactly where Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead. Genesis 22, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested or proved Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Verse 2, he says, now take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you of. Now this is very significant. Now God wanted Abraham to give his best to God. This was the ultimate test, how he loved Isaac. Isaac was the product of his lifetime of prayer and faith. Isaac means laughter because his supernatural birth from God brought great joy into the house. Isaac was his happiness. Through Isaac, God's promises to Abraham would be fulfilled. His destiny was wrapped up in Isaac. He loved him more than life. He was God's greatest gift to him. And now he was to offer him back to God. Now, this was the first use of the word test or prove in the Bible, showing that God searches us, proves us to see if we will put him first. The test reveals where our love, our loyalty is, if it's to God, if we will give God our best. Are we prepared to give up Isaac? Our Isaac, the thing most precious to us? Our blessing from the Lord? Do we love God more or Isaac more? Do we love the giver more than his gifts? Have our blessings become so important to us that it displaces God in our life? Is our faith in God or is it in Isaac? Do we love and trust God absolutely and unconditionally, even if it goes against our common sense and our natural desires? Do we believe that God knows best? This was the nature of the test that Abraham had. We're not to cling on to what God gives us, put it before him, but we must be ready and willing to sacrifice it if God asks us to. Whether it's a p another person, a ministry, a thing, God of asked Abraham to offer up Isaac. And we must go through a s deny self and go through a death of how things ought to be and offer it all up to God. Then he can trust us with more blessing because through that process, our hearts will be purified. A burnt offering represents a consecration of our life to God, acknowledging that everything belongs to him and giving ourselves back to him so that his consuming holy fire can fill us. Now, God doesn't ask us to do something that he's not willing to do for us because in this story, Abraham's a picture of the father God and Isaac is a type of his beloved son who obeyed the father and voluntarily laid down his life as a sacrifice for us. You see, when God says, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, it's clearly pointing beyond Isaac to what God would do in the son that he loved, Jesus Christ. In this verse is the first use of the word love. It's interesting that it's the love between a father and a son, between Isaac and, J and, and Abraham, which is a picture of the eternal love in the Godhead between the father and the son. You see, so the, this is the fount of all love in God. As Jesus said in John 17, 24, Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. And the first use of the word love in all the Gospels is, is, agrees with this. It's in, the, in the Synoptic Gospels, it's the baptism. When God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the first love uh, in John is John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so the, the, the father loved the son 
But even though the Father loved the Son, he was willing to offer him up as a sacrifice for us and for our salvation, to die for us. And the Son consented. That's how much God loves us. This was the drama that Abraham acted out with his son Isaac. God chose him to be a demonstration of what God would do for us. This story is a revelation of God's great love for us that he would give his only beloved son to die for us. And so this is a picture in this story of our redemption in Christ. Now notice, not just any mountain would do. Because it's going to be a picture, just you, not, any mountain would not be any good because it had to be the specific mountain that God would do the ultimate miracle. Not just any mountain would do it, it had to be a specific mount. Because on that same mount, God would offer up his only son to die. 2,000 years later, Abraham offered up Isaac on Mount Moriah, the exact same mount where 2,000 years later, the father offered up his son to die. That's why he says, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains of Moriah, which I will tell you of. Had to be the right mountain. He was go to the land of Moriah. The Moriah means the place where God has chosen to manifest himself. It's the place of the Lord's provision or manifestation. The land of Moriah is the land around Jerusalem. The specific mount in Jerusalem where God told Abraham to offer up Isaac is called Mount Moriah. We know this because later in verse 14, Abraham named it as such. And he sa- it says, Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, the, Lord, the mount where the Lord is seen. That's equivalent to the meaning of Moriah. He named it Mount Moriah there. Well, so we know that where Abraham offered up Jacob, uh, uh, Isaac was Mount Moriah. Now, since God would offer his son on a specific mount, so must Abraham on the same mount, so that the shadow truly reflects and reveals and prepares the way for the substance. So if the, mount, if the Bible reveals the location of Mount Moriah, we will also know the place of Christ's death and resurrection. In fact, the Bible clearly identifies what mountain it is around Jerusalem. Abraham was coming from Bathsheba, about 50 miles to the south. So he would have approached Jerusalem from the south, and he would have seen three hills and three valleys, forming the shape of the Hebrew letter Shin, that looks like our W. It is the first letter of Shalom, which is peace. Remember, Jerusalem means Jerusalem, the city of peace. Its name is written in its very topography. The valley surrounding Jerusalem on the south, going round to the west, is the Valley of Hinnom. The valley on the east side is the Valley of Jehoshaphat, more commonly called the Kidron Valley. And the central valley, which is mostly filled in today, is the Tyropenean Valley. Now at the bottom, where all the valleys meet, is where the Pool of Siloam is located. Because of the Crusaders, the western hill is now called Mount Zion, but that's not its biblical name. The eastern hill is the Mount of Olives, but it's the central hill that is Mount Moriah. How do we know this? Ask any observant Jew and he'll tell you where Mount Moriah is because it's central to their faith. They consider it the most holy place on earth, the place where Abraham offered up Isaac, the place that God has chosen for himself. We know where it is because a thousand years after Abraham, God revealed to King David that the temple must be built on Mount Moriah, the very same hill where Abraham offered up Isaac. That is why the Temple Mount is the most holy and contested piece of real estate even to this day. Now the connection is in 2 Chronicles 3.1. Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the, where the Lord had appeared to his father David, at the place where David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. The Bible says, you see, Mount Moriah is the mount where the temple stood. The plaque erected at the western wailing wall of the temple compound confirms that the Jewish belief is that this is where Abraham offered up Isaac and that's where their temples were built and that God has chosen this special place to manifest his glory. Genesis 22.3 says, So Abraham 
in obedience, rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for a burnt offering and he arose and he went to the place where God had told him. And Abraham rose early for his three-day journey and he's an example to us of, of quick obedience. You see, if you delay to obey, you'll forget. Reasonings will come in. You'll convince yourself not to do it. He knew that God had spoken and that God could be trusted. And so he put aside his natural excuses, his emotions, his reasoning. He didn't dwell in the mental arena, but he brought his thoughts captive to God's word. And so he went early in the morning. Verse 4, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. See, as they approached from the south, God showed him the mount, I believe, by a glory cloud over it. To obey God, he had to offer up Isaac in a specific place. It's essential this was done at the right location because it would lay the foundation for all future sacrifices and especially because that's where the Lord Jesus would be sacrificed 2,000 years later. This was a prophetic picture that he was acting out in the very place where Jesus would be crucified. See, to Abraham, Isaac died the moment God spoke to him because he decided to obey God. Then he received him back, resurrected from the dead on the third day, just like Jesus. Mount Moriah is on three levels. As Abraham approached from the south, he would have first come to the lower level, which was the southern ridge on which was the town of Jerusalem where Melchizedek was king. A thousand years later, this was a Jebusite city which David captured and made his capital. It's called the city of David. Above it to the right, which is to the north, you can see a higher level of Mount Moriah upon which David's son Solomon built the temple. So in Solomon's time, there was the city of David, and then above it to the right stood the temple on the higher level, which is a flat platform top that had been used as a threshing floor, and this is where God told David the altar of the temple had to be. Above the temple platform, there was a higher level still, which is where Abraham must have offered up Isaac. This large model of Jerusalem, now at the Israel Museum, shows the view of the temple from the bottom of Mount Moriah at the south as it looked at the time of Christ. Looking from the south, the Temple Mount towers over the southern ridge where the city of David is. Its higher elevation on the sides of the north signifies its greater holiness and suitability for the location of God's temple, where all the sacrifices of Israel would be offered. Notice, however, that the temple platform is not the peak of Mount Moriah, for as you go up further north, the mountain goes up even higher. From then on, all sacrifices had to be made at the temple on Mount Moriah. They were invalid otherwise. Why? Because that was the holy place God had chosen and marked out for his sacrifices through the foundational sacrifice of Abraham offering up Isaac. In this way, all the sacrifices were pointing forward to the great sacrifice of Christ that was going to be made on the very same mount. The temple was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. And then in the 7th century, this striking golden-topped Islamic monument was built above where the temple stood. It's called the Dome of the Rock because it's built above a piece of natural bare rock called the Foundation Stone, which is at the highest point of the temple platform. The Foundation Stone was the place where the Holy of Holies stood in the temple. As the highest point of the temple platform, it was also the holiest. It is considered by the Jews to be the holiest place on earth. The rock has suffered somewhat at the hands of men over the last 2,000 years, but you can still make out the rectangle cut out in the rock where the Ark of the Covenant would have been placed. Islam has also come to attach importance to this place, and that's why the Dome of the Rock has been built over it. In Jesus' time, the Temple of God stood there rather than the Dome of the Rock. Now, I believe that Abraham did not offer up Isaac where the temple platform is now, because this is not the highest point of Mount Moriah. As you go further north, Mount Moriah goes up to an even higher level. Now, sacrifices were generally made at the high places, so therefore Abraham would not have op offered up Isaac on the flat platform, which was on the way up to the top of the mount. He surely would have done it at the peak of Moriah, which is to the north of the present walls of Jerusalem. So when Abraham and Isaac reached the place of the temple platform, this was a resting place where they would have prepared for their final ascent to the northern peak of Moriah, the place where God commanded him to sacrifice Isaac. You can follow his ascent 
starting at the southern ridge, marked the city of David. Then going up north to the higher flat area, marked as the Temple Mount. And then further north and higher still, to the peak of Mount Moriah, marked on the contour map as Golgotha, meaning the place of the skull. This is outside the present walls, the northern walls of Jerusalem. Yet, it's part of the mount, as what, just as part of the same mount as what we call the Temple Mount today. It's at this peak of Mount Moriah that Abraham must have offered up Isaac. Genesis 22.5 says that as they stood on the temple platform area, Abraham said to the young men, Abide here with the ass, and I and the lad will go up yonder to the peak and worship, and we will come again to you. Isaac was no child, by the way. He was called a lad here, but the word is the same word used for the young men. So he should have been called, really translated as the young man. He was probably 33. So Abraham wasn't forcing him. Isaac was cooperating. Notice Abraham said they would both return. This showed that Abraham believed that God would raise up Isaac from the dead, from the ashes, because he knew that all the promises that were given to him by God concerning Isaac had to be fulfilled. So therefore, if he killed him, God would have to raise him up. And that's exactly what the New Testament says in Hebrews 11, verse 17. It says, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said that in Isaac shall your seed be called accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figure or in a picture. And so the events on Mount Moriah were not just a picture of Christ's death 2,000 years later, but also his resurrection. Verse 6 says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And as he walked from the platform to the peak, Isaac carried on his shoulders the wood that would form the altar upon which he would be sacrificed. Just like Isaac, Jesus had to carry the wood upon which he would be sacrificed. He carried his cross up the same hill to the peak of Mount Moriah. He went voluntarily to lay down his life. And likewise, Jesus was tried and sentenced to death before Pilate at the Antonia Fortress, where Pilate was staying to keep the peace at Passover time. You can see the fortress at the left-hand corner of the Temple Mount. Therefore Jesus, the greater than Isaac, started his walk to the peak of Moriah from the very same place as Isaac. From the northern part of the temple platform, Jesus ascended to the summit of Moriah just as Isaac did 2,000 years before. And then it says, Abraham took fire in his hand. God released his consuming fire on Jesus, judgment on the cross. And then it says, and a knife. And Jesus was pierced and his blood flowed for us. And they both went together. Only Abraham and Isaac went to the top. They left the others behind. And in the same way, the father and the son went together to the cross. Only they could participate in the terrible but necessary inner realities of what took place on the cross. They were working together for our salvation. Verse 7, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So the two went on together. These were prophetic words. He wasn't just saying that God would provide a lamb, but that God would provide himself to be the lamb. God will provide from himself the ultimate sacrifice. In other words, God will provide the lamb from his very own being. God's son himself would be manifest in the flesh as the lamb of God. Verse 9, and they came to the place where God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on the wood. And Abraham must have presented the divine plan to his son. And Isaac submitted to it. As a young man, he could have easily escaped. Isaac's faith and obedience. He gave his life. He's a picture of the greater son, Jesus, you see, who said in Matthew 26, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, as your will. Isaac was laid on the wood of the altar, and Abraham was ready to offer him up to God. Jesus, like Isaac, went to his death voluntarily, laying down his life to obediently fulfill God's plan, trusting God to raise him up again. Verse 10, it says, Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but then the angel of the Lord called out of heaven, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, 
here I am. Abraham was ready to go through it, but God didn't want that. Abraham had done enough to prove his faithfulness. Verse 12, he said, Lay not your hand on the young man. Don't do anything to him, because now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, God didn't contradict himself. He had said that Isaac was to be offered up as a dedication to God. And that's exactly what happened. See, God was interested in Abraham's heart. The angel in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, is Jesus, the Son of God. It was Jesus himself who stopped him because Jesus was ordained to be God's lamb, the one who would take out Isaac's place and die on Mount Moriah as a sacrifice. This was just a dress rehearsal for the ultimate sacrifice, that God would not withhold his son from us, but would offer him up, and this time the greater son would actually die and rise again. So Jesus, the angel of the Lord, said to Abraham, don't kill Isaac, because I myself, the son of God, I will be the true lamb of God. I will be the one offered up as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah, not Isaac. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and he s- to see the angel. And at this point, God gave him a vision of Jesus, God's son, dying on the cross at that very place. Abraham speaks of this vision in the next verse. Also, Jesus said th- about this in John 8, 56. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day, and he saw it. He saw the day of Jesus. He saw Jesus die on the cross. He saw it and was glad. He saw God's son dying for our sins. Galatians 3.8 says God preached the gospel to Abraham, the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection. Well, God then also gave him a sign of this future provision of the Lamb. Verse 13, it says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold a ram caught in the thicket, and he went and took it and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. When we're willing, you see, to offer all we have to God, then God will open our eyes to see his provision for us. God had provided a substitute for Isaac, the ram with his head caught in the thicket, who was a picture of Christ, who God provided for us to be our substitute, to die on the cross in our place as the Ram of God, who also wore a crown of thorns on his head. He died in our place so we wouldn't have to die, but live in God's blessing. Through this story, you see, God was revealing that a sacrificial death was necessary for man's relationship with God to be restored. But instead of us dying, he would provide a substitute. Now initially, provisionally, he would accept an animal, a suitable animal as a substitute. For a man's death. So this sacrifice on Mount Moriah became the founding sacrifice, an archetype for the whole animal sacrificial system that God gave to Israel. These sacrifices had to take place on the temple on Mount Moriah because of their connection to the original sacrifice, which had set Mount Moriah apart for this purpose. God's choice of a mount and Abraham's obedience had sanctified the mount for the fulfillment of God's redemptive purposes there. All the temple sacrifices were expressions of Abraham's original sacrifice on Mount Moriah. And they were all prophetic pictures pointing to their fulfillment in Christ, the final sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Praise God. That's why Jesus had to die on Mount Moriah. Animal sacrifices could never atone. They were just preparatory until God would provide his only begotten son to be the final sacrifice, to fulfill all that happened before on Mount Moriah. And that's why he had to die on the mount that God had set aside for this purpose, Mount Moriah. The ram that God originally provided as a substitute was not the ultimate lamb of God, Jesus, but just a picture of that lamb of God who would be offered up in the same place on Mount Moriah's highest and most holy point. Whereas God gave Israel the temple mount to do their animal sacrifices, he reserved the highest and holiest place on Moriah for the original sacrifice of Isaac and the final sacrifice of the greater Isaac, Jesus. Genesis 22, 14 confirms this prophetic vision of Abraham that this was not any one-off sacrifice but the prophetic forerunner for what God would do on that same mount. Abraham made a declaration, you see, at this point that revealed that God had now established the continuous sanctity of this mount as the place of sacrifice, not just for the temple sacrifices, but also for the ultimate sacrifice to which they pointed.
Let's read verse 14. It's so crucial. And so Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord our provider or our provision. As it is said to this day, I want you to notice the location was faithfully passed down the generations. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it will be seen. His provision will be seen. Or the mount where the Lord is seen. Or the mount where the Lord is manifested. Or the mount where the Lord will be provided. Just as it said in verse 8, the Lord will provide himself as the lamb. See, Abraham was declaring his vision that Mount Moriah would be the place of the Lord's provision. God had initially chosen the mount and Abraham's sacrifice had invested it with the holiness, sanctifying it for all the temple sacrifices as well as for the ultimate sacrifice. Abraham's declaration can only be fulfilled by the coming Messiah who would be sacrificed for us. On the mount of the Lord, it, the final sacrifice, will be seen. It's a clear statement that God's provision of himself as a sacrifice would be on Mount Moriah. And the ram caught in the thicket was not the ultimate provision. It was just a prophetic symbol of it. Then Abraham declared, you see, that's why he said, this is the mount where the Lord will be seen. Hallelujah. This mount is the place where Jehovah Jireh would be revealed for God would provide all the needs of man through this lamb. You see, provision means to see ahead and provide what is needed. And so God saw ahead what man needed for salvation and provided it in Christ, manifesting it in his death and resurrection on Mount Moriah. Jehovah Jireh means the God of physical manifestation, meaning the Lord himself would be manifested in human flesh as our provision, as the sacrificial lamb we need. And it would be thus in this Mount Moriah that he would be manifested as the lamb of God, offered up as the all-sufficient sacrifice for our sins. That's what Abraham saw in his vision. He saw the Lord himself offered up as the Lamb of God on Mount Moriah. And Abraham was declaring what God shown him, that God would provide himself as the Lamb of God and that he prophesied that on this very Mount Moriah, the Lord would be seen being provided by God as the ultimate offering for man. And today these prophetic words of Abraham have been fulfilled through the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Lord has indeed provided himself as the full provision for our salvation. In order to fulfill this prophecy, Jesus must have died and rose again on Mount Moriah, even at its peak, north of the temple platform. Next time I'm going to show you how Jesus fulfilled this all perfectly.